Good evening. Thank you all for coming out to this event. My name is Morgan Conley. I'm a graduate student in the Jackson School's Applied International Studies program. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first event in the Global Nuclear Citizen series. Uh, we have a packed agenda. I'm going to start just with some introductions. Uh, first, Amy from U uh, Amy Mayhew from UW's Diversity and Clean Energy is going to say a few words. Hi everybody, my name is Amy. I'm an officer with the UW's Diversity and Clean Energy Group, or DICE. And um, just wanted to let you guys know that's something that happens here. Um, if anyone is ever interested, we do events, networking events mainly, with professionals in clean energy and clean tech to promote opportunities um, for people from underrepresented backgrounds to get into the clean tech se sector. But um, anyone is welcome to any of our events. We do a lot of like informational type meetings with seminar speakers here on campus or um, with local professionals. So I'll put the email up on the board, but it's uwdice at uw.edu if um, anyone is interested in getting on the listserv for that. Great. Thank you so much. And next up um, is James Penna, and he is from the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management. So, ooh, that's right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is James, as Morgan said, and the Institute for Nuclear Materials Management is another thing that happens here on campus. So we are actually a chapter of a national organization, an international organization, actually, that promotes um, career development and research in nuclear technology and also um, developments for people working in nuclear policy. So we kind of see all sides of the nuclear spectrum, as it were. Um, Sassone is one of our members, and it was fantastic that she's organizing this global nuclear series, um, independent of us, which is nice. But we have similar talks that occur all throughout our campus um, throughout the year. We also do uh, fun events, such as a trivia night. So if you would like to uh, know more about that, and I guess I'll put up the date as well. That's next Friday. We have a nuclear trivia night. Um, Next month, around this time, we're anticipating on putting on a career uh, panel for those of you that are students and are looking into careers not just in nuclear energy and technology, but also policy, um, weapons, etc. Well, weapons mitigation and things of that nature. And with that, I'll turn it over to these ladies. Okay, thank you, James. And That's our email on the board. <laughs> Thank you, James and Amy. Um, so now I'm really excited to introduce the moderator and organizer for tonight's event, Sasone Hayashi. Uh, Sasone is a friend and classmate who's worked very hard over the past few months to coordinate this event, in addition to being a graduate student and a mom of two adorable kids. Um, so Sasone is a graduate student in the Jackson School's Applied International Studies program. She's also a nuclear medicine technologist. Um, in addition to working in the nuclear medicine field, uh, she's also had experience teaching English abroad, specifically in Japan. Uh, please give me, uh, please join me in giving me in giving a warm welcome to Sasson and to our panelists. Hi there, good evening. Thank you all for coming out. I see a lot of classmates out there. Thank you guys. Uh, I just want to know that you will be videotaped, and this will be on YouTube. So I'm starting an event called Nuclear, Nuclear or Global Nuclear Citizen Series to kind of showcase all the different aspects of the field so that those who are interested, uh, especially what's going on right now around the world with what's going on in North Korea, uh, what's happened in Chernobyl, Fukushima, and things like that. We'll kind of touch on those uh, aspects throughout uh, the next uh, student calendar year, 2019. So uh, just look for it if you're interested and if you'd like to come on down, that'd be great. So I'd like to introduce our panelists here. Me. So we have uh, Tristan Hay, he's in the center in the red checkered shirt here. <laughs> um, he comes from uh, Oregon. Uh, he has, he's a radiation health physicist, he's a PhD. Uh, he's worked at PNL here in Seattle and over in Hanford, is that correct? Oh, that was in Ridgeland. Oh, Ridgeland, okay. Spanning radiation physics to environmental health. He currently works for the Washington Department of Health and the Radiation Protection Group. 
In his job, he oversees radioactive material use in hospitals, labs, and industrial applications across the state of Washington. And then next we have the gentleman on my far right is uh, Dr. Scott Davis. He is a radiation, is it right? yeah. radiation epidemiologist. He's actually uh, was a teacher here in this department here back in 2006 in the Eurasian Studies Department. He's also a professor in Ritus at the Public Health over on the other side of campus. And he, uh, epidemiology is his specialty. He's a long and distinguished career in the field of epidemiology. He has held appointments with Fred Hutch, and of course, uh, two departments here at the UW. He has authored numerous publications and has spanned his career in research covering both ionizing and non-ionizing regime, which we'll get to. Uh, he's done uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and circadian disruption as of recent. Scott led the partnership between Japan and the University of Washington School of Public Health for the uh, Program on Radiation Effects Research Foundation to study the A-bomb survivors in Japan. And uh, Professor Amanda Phipps runs the current program. So if you're interested, uh, seek out Amanda Phipps in their um, radiation or the epidemiology department of public health for those who are interested. And then last, the young gentleman here to my right. This is uh, Philip Tadai. He is a medical physicist, uh, PhD. He also is a board certified, which is not an easy feat. It's a long, it's a long haul, huh? Not easy to do. <laughs> Phil, <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He, um, he's currently at the Seattle Proton Therapy Center here in Seattle. Uh, he is also an assistant professor of medical physics at the University of Washington uh, Radiation Oncology Department. And before he came to UW, he actually worked at the American University in Beirut. Anybody know where Beirut's at out there? You guys know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so he worked at American University and uh, did some research there actually uh, with uh, focus on uh, pediatric radiation therapy. He's also worked at MD Anderson in Texas. And he can find a lot of his work in physics and medicine and biology journal if you want to go ahead and read up on some of his research. And he's an advocate for children in developing countries to have access to safe, effective proton therapy. So give a warm welcome to our panelists. So the first topic of the night, we're just going to talk about, you know, what is radiation? We hear about it. We experience it going to the hospital with testing. Uh, we have relatives that have cancer. So we'll go ahead and uh, start off with that. Uh, basic notion here. So, what is what is radiation anyway? I can answer that in two two words: uh, energetic particles, and more specifically, energetic particles that transfer that have enough kinetic energy to transfer energy to objects that are in their path. Um, they do that uh, in different ways depending on the kind of particle that it is, um, and when that energy is deposited or transferred and deposited in that in those objects, we call that dose. Dose just means, in general, amount given. So we measure dose, radiation dose or absorbed dose is the main uh, measure that we use when we're talking about radiation. It's just defined as energy deposited per mass. So in the units of dose are gray, or if we take into account biological effects, uh, sieverts. So um, that's kind of the basis of what radiation is. I think a good place if you want to think about what is radiation and how does it affect us as humans or uh, our electronics or our environment is the question, is radiation good or is it bad? And probably the answer is both. And you can think of ways that radiation can be used uh, for good things and for bad things. It can be used to produce energy. It can be used to... Uh, treat cancer and other diseases. It can be. It used to be used to uh, produce uh, television images. Well, uh, not so much anymore. Um, and other ways that radiation can be used. Uh, it can be used to um, destroy bacteria and food. Um, and then it can be used for defense or even in peace. Um, on the other side, it could be used to make war. 
It could be used to um, induce pain and suffering. It can be um, damaging to humans and the environment and animals. Um, so this is kind of some of the ways radiation is all around us. It's, um, you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. If you hold out your hand, I think it's something like every 10 seconds a muon will go out your, go through your hand. If you hold out your hand like this, and a muon is a tertiary particle that's coming uh, from cosmic radiation that interacts with the atmosphere. Um, there's radiation in the cement in this building. Um, there's radiation in the soil. Um, a lot of it is natural, and some of it is man-made. Um, so that's kind of a, a start or a background on what is radiation. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, I'm an epidemiologist, and I'm, I'm here to provide that perspective to the discussion. Uh, and you hit on a couple of key points that I wanted to call our attention to. Oh, thanks. Um, and that is, radiation isn't radiation isn't resi radiation. There are different types of radiation that have different biological, uh, the potential for uh, biological damage. And uh, currently, um, we know quite a bit about how that works, why some radiation types don't uh, produce much of a risk and others do. So that, that's, I think, a key, key issue. And it is for epidemiological studies for sure, because uh, when it comes time to try to figure out what a person's dose is, as opposed to exposure, uh, it, it's a uh, tough go. So I think it's important to keep in mind as we go through these discussions that radiation isn't just a term that can encompass all types of radiation. It, yeah, I should elaborate a little. Maybe I'll back up uh, just a little. I'm not sure what the level of uh, technical understanding is in this room, but we, there's kind of two types of radiation. There's ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation is kind of what we're all specialists in, and ionizing radiation is the kind that can cause uh, damage. That ionizing, it can knock off an ion. So when you knock off an ion, um, sometimes it can mess with cells, and depending on how many times you do this, you can cause damage, or you can repair things in the medical field, or, uh, um, or not repair, but kill off cells you want to. And, um, so yeah, the, uh, the non-ionizing uh, radiation is like uh, things, we're talking about like light, like microwaves, infrared, uh, radio waves, those type of things. So uh, the reason um, ionizing, like I said, it uh, can be dangerous, so we have to regulate it and whatnot. And in that ionizing uh, radiation field, we kind of have, uh, there's a different particles in the, um, in the atom that, can, that are the radiation. So we have alpha particles, we have uh, beta particles, and, which is essentially electron. And then we have uh, gamma, which is uh, um, it, it's along the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's kind of like light, only it comes from the nucleus of the cell or the, the atom. And then we also have, did I say neutrons? No. Okay. And then we have neutrons, which also comes from the nucleus. And and X-ray and gamma are the same thing, really, except for where the point of origin is. So X-rays come from the electrons. Gamma rays come from the nucleus. Um, so those are the main types of ionizing radiation that uh, we'll come in contact with. And I won't go down the, the really technical route, but there's different ways to combat all those particles and, and uh, what to do about them. Maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Thank you, guys. Uh, so what are the different uses of these types of radiation in medicine? Specifically, you go to the doctor's office, you get an x-ray, um, we have uh, feminists that get treated with cancer. 
what all different types of diagnostic and therapy and uh, research? Phil would probably be the best answer. Uh, well, um, there's really, um, I'd say, three areas of um, how radiation is used in medicine. The first is in nuclear medicine. <clears throat> I don't spend a lot of time in nuclear medicine. Uh, the second is in diagnostic imaging. I do spend some time with that. And then the third is in therapeutic, uh, in radiation therapy, in radiation oncology, and other, we treat other lesions with, with radiation. And how it's used is, um, depending on how uh, the, the material that is, let's say, for beginning with uh, diagnostic imaging. Um, radiation will pass through different objects of different density, or more specifically, electron density, um, in, in, um, by depositing energy faster or slower. And we can use that to our advantage to create images. Um, nowadays, we have uh, computed tomography that can, within about a minute, um, produce a three-dimensional image of your body. And it can be used to uh, diagnose diseases. Um, but also map out your body so that we can treat different diseases like cancer. Um, in therapeutic, um, in radiation therapy, we use mainly photons. That's sort of a conventional way to treat uh, cancer and other diseases. Secondly, we use electrons to treat uh, different kinds of uh, lesions in the body. And then here in uh, Seattle, we have the only uh, proton therapy center in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, we have faculty from UW, this campus, at doing each of those things. We also have at the University of Washington the only uh, neutron therapy center in the United States and one of the maybe two in the world that are functioning and only one in operation, I believe. So we have pretty much everything at our disposal here in, in Seattle to treat, to treat cancer with uh, therapeutically with radiation. The way that radiation works and to treat cancer and other lesions or other diseases is it kills. So we um, design treatment plans to kill the bad cells in your body and to try our best to spare the healthy cells in your body from radiation damage. When radiation pa passes through your body, we think about how it deposits energy in cells and does damage to mainly DNA. Um, it does that either directly or indirectly, but really what happens is it, it causes ionizations, like Tristan was speaking of, in water and other molecules around the DNA, and it's those free radicals that are created that do damage to the DNA. They can either cause a single strand break or a double strand break. It's the double strand breaks that often kill the cell. If we kill enough of them, we can kill something more massive like tissue or a tumor. Um, so radiation works in, in four different ways as it, as it interacts with cells and DNA. It can either do nothing, it can cause uh, damage that can be uh, healed or repaired, it can cause uh, damage that doesn't repair, and it can kill the cell. And when we talk about treating tumors or causing uh, necrosis or cell death, um, that's the kind that where we kill cells. When we talk about side effects of radiation, uh, that maybe are long term. Uh, we talk; those are the ones that repair incorrectly and cause either mutagenesis mutations that can lead to carcinogenesis cancer. So we treat the cancer. We can also uh, cause cancer and other kinds of effects while we're treating the cancer, and that's sort of the game that we play in, in therapeutic radiation uh, and medical radiation. You, you go ahead. Sure, I can kind of. Uh, talk about some of the imaging. Does anyone know like uh, how an x-ray actually works? Anyone? Uh, we got a couple that are raising hands. Okay, we got some nods. All right, so I'll, I'll kind of just explain the, the basics. So you've all seen the, the image of just the bones, the black and white image. So what's happening with those is uh, the photons, in this case x-rays, are uh, being beamed through whatever appendage or whatever body part you stick in front of there. And so the bone inside your body is more dense. And so the uh, x-rays going through are getting stopped by the bone. So when you see the black on the x-ray, um, it used to be film, now there's a lot more digital involved. But 
So when you look at the, the film or the picture, the black is where the x-rays got through and the white is where they got stopped by something. So that's why you get a perfect uh, image of, say, a hand on there and you can see all the bone structures because the bones stopped the x-rays from going through. So that's uh, the basics of, of x-rays and uh, then it, it goes way up from there, so that's how they kind of started. And then, uh, like, for example, a CAT scan. Does anyone know how a CAT scan works? Okay, we got some nods. So a CAT scan is essentially an x-ray machine that's doing circles. So now we can get 3D pictures. So you're essentially taking a, I don't know how many, but a lot of x-rays, and you're getting it from all around. And um, let's see. And, oh, yes, the other one. So so we'll probably talk more about this one, but... When you do uh, uh, nuclear medicine, now that's almost the opposite of when we take a normal x-ray. But instead we're putting a radioactive material in you that emits uh, photons. And now when that flows around your body, we put a camera on the outside of your body. And so we can figure out, okay, where is this radionuclide going inside the body? And now we can get a good image of it because we got the camera outside. Do you want to elaborate on that one? Yeah, I'll elaborate a little bit. So. The way that works actually targets a specific cell at the cellular level. So let's say you want to look at um, your bone and find out if there's uh, any uh, micro fracture with that. They can't figure out that it's broken, they can't see. So what they do is they see how the bone actually behaves. There's uh, osteoblasts that are bone remodeling. So what the nucleotide actually does is it targets the, those cells that are rebuilding the actual bone. So any sort of injury you've had, all throughout your life from like childhood, like men come in from vets from the war and you see where the damage was in shrap metal from like 30 years ago. So it shows any sort of remodeling, like um, any sort of uh, cases where children have been abused, it'll show if, because a lot of times the x-rays can't pick up on that. There's also, um, what else recently, uh, let's say, oh, they tag it to immunology, so they take the white blood cells, spit it down, they tag the radiation into the white blood cells and they'll re-inject that through a vein and they'll go ahead and see if it were infections out in the body and they can't figure out where it's coming from. So that's another use of it. But the scans are really hard to see, so a lot of times they call it unclear medicine. Because they're like, <laughs> what am I looking at? It looks like there's like this blob on the screen. But if you understand why, what particular nucleotide they're using, and then they usually superimpose it to an x-ray or a pet. I don't remember that. But uh, to kind of see the image there. And um, would you like to add anything then, Dr. This is a little out of my uh, area of the medical uses. Okay, well, we'll get into your area then. Um, so we're going to go ahead and change topics here and talk about disasters. Uh, here, Who here has any interest in the nuclear disasters? What's going on in the news or whatnot? Okay, there we go. Um, so we're lucky here tonight. We have uh, some really well educated gentlemen on the subject. Um, with things that happened in Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima most recently, uh, plus in our own backyard, you know, Hanford, just across the mountains there. Um, you know, a lot of times reactors do, things do happen, and what are the effects of it? What are the long and short-term effects when the reactors do uh, misbehave due to natural consequences or whatnot? So, um, would you like to go ahead and... Sure. I'll start. <laughs> All right, let's 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 start with uh, Chernobyl. That's probably the one accident or occurrence that uh, has a lot of these features to it. Uh, are there people out there who have special knowledge or any knowledge of the Chernobyl accident? Good, quite a, quite a few of you. So I won't go through that very... Uh, in much depth, but simply to say that this was an accident that occurred because of um, an unscheduled and unmonitored safety check that went awry, uh, blew the um, top off the reactor and the containment building was completely gone. And the, the wind patterns determined, of course, where the bulk of the material go. And uh, early on, people in the government uh, started mapping those 
distributions of radionuclides, primarily cesium-137, and um, some plutonium, some strontium. That was important to get a first estimate of what they were dealing with. And it was bigger than anybody had feared. Um, the exposure patterns to the surrounding population were determined entirely politically. And um, in fact, the people at, in a town right across the river from the reactor, a place called Pripyat, uh, about 75,000 people or so, weren't told about the accident at all for two or three days. And then they finally started wheeling them out in uh, buses and caravans. Uh, it's important to now think about what I said earlier about different types of radiation having different effects. The, one of the primary radionuclides that would have exposed residents of Pripyat was radioactive iodine. And because it has a relatively short half-life, it, um, it had largely done its damage by the time those first buses arrived in Pripyat. So that's a sad little part of this story, but it's true. And it was manifest again and again and again as you move out from the plant in circles of different diameters. Um, by the time they got around to removing people from those areas, the damage was like, like pretty much done and it would be to the thyroid. So I guess uh, the, the take home message here is that as you plan for a possible event here or anywhere, um, it really pays to think about what the distribution of radionuclide release will be and then try to uh, match that with an appropriate uh, preventive uh, strategy if, if there is one. Um, I think I'll stop there and see if anybody wants to comment. Chernobyl was a little, I think I was two when Chernobyl had a little before <laughs> my time. <laughs> Okay. So uh, Fukushima actually happened fairly recently, and a lot of people come to ask me, they say, oh, can I eat the fish? Is that okay? Can I go to Hawaii next month? Can I go swim in the ocean? Am I going to get cancer? You know, is that okay? Um, they also spoke about uh, a particular <coughs> pill that uh, some of the residents near Fukushima were taking to block the uptake of iodine specifically, because your thyroid uptakes iodine, they use it to a whole host of mostly uh, metabolism specifically. There's a lot of different ways in which your thyroid uh, uses the body. But a lot of the residents there were taking a specific pill there. So um, is that what I need to take when I go to Japan? I mean, is that what you do? Then I can speak on that? Yeah, I can. Go ahead. I guess I can talk a little bit about Fukushima. So uh, with the Fukushima, the, um, so the main part that knocked it out the uh, reactors was the, uh, the tsunami. So they had generators outside the facility that make sure we keep water, or they kept water in the reactor. You always want to keep re reactor fuel cool because you don't want fuel melting, that's very bad. So um, that's why they have backup generators for if something happens, they could turn on the backup generators to keep water flowing in the reactor. And well, uh, they built their um, generators kind of outside and they had a, a wall level that would keep water out, but I, this tsunami that happened was a lot bigger than they kind of expected. And so it flooded the generators and without the generators, they weren't able to keep uh, the fuel cool. And when the fuel started burning and it releases a lot of gas and uh, um, one of those gases, uh, it, it's not a nuclear explosion that that we saw in uh, Fukushima, it was the gases build up, in this case hydrogen, and hydrogen kind of blew off the pipes and blew off the top of the building. And so now we had uh, burning fuel that was just exposed to the outside. And uh, kind of similar to Chernobyl, not a good thing to have uh, kind of fission particles and all that just floating down downwind. 
Um, but yeah, the, the iodine that we were talking about, um, so that pill is called potassium iodine, and it, I want you all to remember this. Potassium iodine is only for iodine. So it's not a magic radiation blocking pill or anything. It's for that radioactive iodine that can be released from reactors. And uh, so if you take this iodine, basically what it does is you're putting stable iodine and you're clogging your thyroid with the stable iodine. So when you get the uh, radioactive iodine in, it just kind of passes your thyroid because it's full of the stable iodine already. So that's all it does. It's not an anti-radiation. I mean, you still got other radiation to deal with and whatnot, but that's kind of just... And, and you have to take it fairly soon after the event. Uh, I mean, uh, within hours if possible, a short number of days. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the Fukushima... Uh, accident, I guess, if you want to say that about the protective wall, um, was, it, it just absolutely stunned me. I went on a, a tour, basically, of the area with a group of scientists around the world that was invited to look at the site, and um, you just can't believe that water would do what it did. Uh, it looked like a, a field of pickup sticks. Uh, just incredibly damaged. Everything was just completely torn apart. And uh, of course the atmospheric uh, release that uh, followed. Uh, now, Sir, yeah. I don't recall, was there any uh, deaths associated with, with the release of radiation in Fukushima? No. no. Zero deaths. Or injuries. Right. That's a nice segue to what I was going to bring up, and that is, um, you had mentioned uh, long-term versus short-term effects, and they're really quite different the way you go about looking at that. Um, I'm an epidemiologist. I tend to think in terms of larger groups of people being followed over time to see what happens long-term. That's uh, probably a luxury that we'll not see again. Its extreme example is uh, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Japan. They have uh, monitored several cohorts, but the main cohort uh, monitored since the uh, explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, run about 125,000 people. And they have kept track of those people, they've provided medical care to those people, and they've uh, invested an enormous amount of money and time to defining a dosimetry that will adequately and accurately portray what the person actually got in terms of a dose. Um, that is so expensive and time consuming that I don't think we'll see anything quite like that again. But it's a good model to, to think about. I, we probably don't have time to say much about the details of that. But, uh, yeah, Phil, do you want to say that? Uh, well, I was just going to, I thought it would be a sure success story <laughs> <laughs> um, of, of an accident that happened in this country. Um, so after I finished my PhD in radiological health sciences at Colorado State University, I did a postdoctoral fellowship for 15 months at the Naval Academy, the U.S. Naval Academy. Except they didn't have... Uh, postdoc positions there, so they, I got to be an assistant professor. But anyway, another faculty member and I, <clears throat> I was in the aerospace engineering department doing things with space radiation, dosimetry. And, but it's in the same building as nuclear engineering, and a lot of students kind of went back and forth between departments. So one of the faculty at the nuclear engineering department invited me to go with him to take seven or eight students up to um, Three Mile Island. And I'd heard of Three Mile Island. This is um, uh, a nuclear uh, power facility that's still in operation. But um, was it about 30 years ago, 35 years ago? Um, they had an accident. And um, what's interesting about Three Mile Island is because of the radiation safety measures that were put into place, this could have been a disaster. Um, because of the radiation safety measures that were put into place, there was virtually no release of radiation to the public. It was contained. And we've never had um, a public release of um, 
radiation from the nuclear power industry um, in the U.S. So that's a success story. Um, when you think about those safety measures, um, just to put it in perspective, um, it's dangerous to go drive a car, right? You could get in an accident. You could be killed. Maybe even more dangerous to drive, ride your bike out here on University Avenue. There's crazy drivers that aren't paying attention. So what do you do? You take safety measures to make sure that that, to, to minimize the risk that that would happen. You put on bright clothing, you wear a helmet, um, you follow the traffic laws, you go to the side of the road. These are the kind of things that, that we, we sort of deal with in our day-to-day -day life um, in dealing with radiation safety, whether it's for patients or for the public. Um, how can we, what, what can we do to minimize the risk of negative, either detrimental damage or the, the probability of, of damage uh, from radiation? Um, I guess the other other part you said uh, about is it okay to eat the fish? Yes, <laughs> you're fine. If you think about how big the Pacific Ocean is, uh, it's quite a long way and a lot of dilution. Um, it, have any of you heard the old toxicologist saying dilution is the solution to pollution? <laughs> so, when you have that much dilution, by the time anything gets over here, it's hard to really even find. But so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I might add to that that it's, it's really difficult to determine what the long-term effects are. There's so many things that intervene between the time of exposure and the time a condition is, is diagnosable and diagnosed by a medical person. Um, and I, I just want to call your attention to the fact that there are study designs uh, epidemiologic study designs that are geared towards trying to uh, eliminate some of those other factors and focus in on the radiation dose itself. Some are more efficient than others. Some can be done with only s selected people uh, because there isn't enough information. They look backwards in time. You only have information to go forward, those kinds of considerations. But it, it, it's probably um, sort of something short of a miracle that we find anything at all in these studies. Uh, it's very difficult to find a dose response positive effect. Uh, and the A-bomb survivor studies have done a tremendous job in that regard. But some of these other accidents or events don't lend themselves to being very informative with an epidemiological study, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, for our closing statements, is there any anecdotal stories in Beirut or perhaps in the environment that you'd like to add, or any research you're currently working on that you'd like to highlight? Any last uh, statements? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, uh, I don't know if you caught it or not with the introductions, but I am now officially retired, and uh, I have an emeritus appointment, but I'm still working. The only difference is I don't get paid. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to put in a, a quick plug for looking at other types of radiation, the non-ionizing forms of radiation, which are basically the very low frequency um, power lines around the house, electrical appliances, um, things that those uh, radiations that affect the function of the pineal gland, the release of melatonin, and the uh, possibility that those events will eventually lead to cancer. So we've, we've done a number of studies already and it's continuing with a junior faculty member now where we're looking at all aspects of circadian disruption, much of it caused by different radiation exposures and the effect of, uh, of those exposures on the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So don't leave out the non-ionizing. You know, actually, there's some experimental methods for treating uh, cancer with non-ionizing radiation, like with ultrasound. Yeah. 
um, or heat. Um, my research is in um, reducing the, or looking into advanced therapeutic techniques with the purpose of reducing late effects that are caused by radiation. Um, especially for children, because children are in general more susceptible to radiation effects for a given dose than adults, maybe by a factor of five. Um, girls are more susceptible than boys. Um, and um, so what, how, what can we do in, in our field to reduce the risk of those late effects? Um, and in particular, in our group, we are looking at uh, advanced therapeutic techniques that can be applied in high-income countries and situations like I described in Seattle, but also in developing countries. I guess one story about one study that we started um, in Beirut and I left in the middle of, and I'm going back uh, in two weeks to finish up, is with sheep. And so, as I said, um, we we're especially concerned about children, and we, were, we are giving these sheep some advanced fields or new fields that we're designing that we would like to apply to children someday if we can see that it's safe for the sheep. And it has to do with bone effects. So um, because we were using sheep as an animal model for children, we had to uh, purchase them as lambs. And I didn't know this. I'd never worked with animals really before. But uh, lambs, they only really eat from their mothers. And we purchased, when, when we got them, they were about four weeks old. And on the website at the American University of Beirut, if you go to the animal care facility uh, page, it will describe to you all the things they're going to do for you, including animal husbandry. So I assumed that they were going to take care of the, the sheep. So after we purchased these 12 little lambs, I'm driving back uh, with one of my colleagues, uh, a student of mine, and the head veterinarian at the American University of Beirut, and he said, you know, Phil, how are you going to feed these sheep? I said, Dr. Fouad, I'm not feeding these sheep. That's, that's your job. He said, no, we don't have the resources to do that. So I had to gather quickly uh, 12 volunteers and five st uh, student workers to feed. And, you know, volunteers included my children, my family, our friends, <laughs> immediately to uh, force feed uh, uh, powdered milk you know, for these, these lambs that didn't know how to eat anything except when they were hungry, they'd go to their uh, mothers. So we learned a lot from those sheep. Um, <laughs> they were mischievous and difficult to, very difficult to work with, but they knew their shepherd too, like children. Um, they knew me when I entered the room. Um, when I would leave the room, sometimes if I leave the pens open in the, the room they were staying, they would come out and search around for things that are on the room. And as soon as I came back in the room, they would run back to their pens. I never taught them to do that. They just would naturally do that and obey their shepherd. So anyway, lots of stories about those sheep, and man, was that trouble. But anyway, um, I think it's, we, we're hopeful that it's going to do a lot of good. I guess I kind of got an interesting story about my life in the health physics field. Um, I used to be a, a scientist at a DOE national laboratory and if you've ever seen Stranger Things it's nothing like that. No, it's not as fun. But there was one uh, fun day when um, I was working on a project involving up people's uptake of radionuclides and uh, one of the senior scientists came over and he said, hey have you ever been to USTUR? And I said no, I have no idea what USTUR is. And stands for Uranic and Transuranic uh, something registry. And I said, well, okay, I'll go visit. And so we go there and we visit. It's actually in Richland, and it, it, I don't know if I can say this, but it's run by WSU, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we go over there, and um, we go in the back room, and it's just full of freezers, freezers and jars everywhere. And. Uh, the, the guy running it walks over and he says, oh, well, this is where we keep anyone who's been uh, exposed to radiation and they, if they wanted to donate their body, then they can donate their body or pieces of their body. And the scientist goes over to a freezer and opens it and just pulls out a hand and he's like, see, we've got hands here and we've got all sorts of body parts. And he goes over a freezer and there's just a whole leg laying in there. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. But uh, yeah, so they've got all sorts of... Uh, 
people who've been irradiated and who've donated stuff. Uh, like the, you ever heard of the radium girls, the ones who, uh, they got jaw cancer and all that. Well, uh, a lot of them were actually over there still. And they can use those for studies to track things. It's actually pretty cool that, uh, A, that people were willing to donate their bodies to science, but B, the science that you can obtain from that. from Because we don't really like injecting people with radiation on purpose, unless it's for medical studies or whatnot. But high doses of radiation, it's not something we normally do. So when people, that does happen accidentally, they donated their body and now we have something to say, hey, uh, you, you got a bunch of cesium in your lungs. We know what happens because this one person did it one time. So kind of cool. There's some really interesting stuff if you dig into the radiation field. Yeah, make one quick comment. You'll be happy to know that the Russians have taken up the same activity and uh, um, uh, Organ Bank in uh, the deep Siberian wilderness. Uh, there's a jar, row after row after row of jars. The only difference it seems that between the one you saw and this one is that this one doesn't have any refrigeration or freezing capacity. So it's a big jars of formaldehyde that have been there for God knows how long. I had no idea about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're going to open up the floor for Q&A. Uh, so come down and use the microphone. Oh, feel free to ask any question. There are no dumb questions in the field of radiation. So ask anything. There are no stupid questions. Oh, one man. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to one woman? Can I just stand from here? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There are, uh, so I read something about the uh, radioactive spots that are uh, in Germany. Can you, do you know anything about this? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so those are called radium spas, or radon spas. So uh, radon is just a natural product that we find in the ground. It's one of the uranium, it, it's a daughter product of uranium um, in the, the decay series. So uranium is a natural, uh, kind of like a, it's a rock. And as it decays, one of those uh, decay products is radium, which then goes to radon. Radon is a gas. So gas likes to seep out of things, and uh, it likes to collect in enclosed areas. Like people will test their basements for radon and stuff, and you really don't want a much of it because if if you're breathing in something radioactive, it's just like we were talking earlier. It can affect the cells and kind of damage them. So the the theory of those is that if you get a small amount of radiation from breathing this radon in, it's supposed to be good for you, but. Really, it's not good for you, <laughs> so uh, don't do it. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of—it's kind of one of those snake medicine, snake oil things. Uh, we lived in Japan for two years, uh, working in RRM, and one of the big deals uh, in terms of entertainment was to go to one of these spas and. Uh, they were signs all over the entryway, uh, espousing the benefits of going in the water. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time in the water, but uh, it was uh, it was taken seriously. Thank you guys very much. It's been interesting. Um, you talked about the. Um, Radioactive iodine in Chernobyl, and I was yeah. just wondering if there was, if that's a typical, like if any nuclear reactor was to release nuclear material, if that would be an iodine radioaction, radioactive material, or if there are other radioactive materials that it would include, and also if that would be like, if, does the hydrogen bomb have hydrogen? I mean, what does that actually look like, and are there other materials that you could? absorb prematurely so that you don't absorb radioactive material. Can you repeat the question? Oh, so he was wondering if there's a, like during a nuclear power accident, is there other radioisotopes that are emitted and how does like the radioiodine get emitted and, and whatnot. Um, 
So I guess let me get my physics right here. So uh, a reactor works by uh, nuclear fission. And uh, when you get the, the isotope is, uh, well, sorry, the radionuclide is uranium. It's usually uranium-235, 238. So when those split, you get half of that. And one of a typical, it, it's, if you've ever heard of the May West curve, it's kind of this giant M. <laughs> so you get a, a particles, new elements that are on either side. When you split 238, like you have 131 and whatever, 131 plus, or 238 minus 131 will give you another particle. So iodine 131, 129, the iodine is half of that. So it's a, a fission product that is always um, released in the, in, when you have fission. Now uh, iodine it happens to be also really volatile. So it likes to move. So when you uh, blow the top off of a reactor, now we have this fission product of iodine that likes to get out. And um, so that can kind of seep around. That's why we were talking about the time limit. So it gets out fairly quick, and then it dies off fairly quick, too. So um, if you take that KI pill, then you're kind of blocking that iodine. But there are other fission products. I know you talked about cesium. And um, there's, there's a lot of fission products that can be released. But iodine, because it likes to go to your thyroid and it's really volatile, is one of the worst. Oh, <coughs> oh the other, the other way. <laughs> <You> <laughs> want to? <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Cesium-137 and yttrium-90, strontium-90. Cesium-137 half-life is 30 years, is that right? Yeah, it's so that's, 30 years. that's how long it lasts. Half of it will be gone in 30 years. So um, it takes several half-lives to have. Um, yeah. So it's going to be around for a while. And far worse than the accidents, we didn't even talk about the um, weapons development. Right. Over the over the decades, um, especially early on, that was a mess, and you've got that here in Hanford. But um, just the fallout. Um, I don't know if this is true. I don't have a citation for this, but my professor in graduate school, uh, my first year of graduate school, said that every handful of soil on the Earth has nuclear fallout: cesium-137, strontium-90, um, plutonium as well. Traces of plutonium. Plutonium, which is not, it's not a naturally occurring element. We produce that in the laboratory. So it's probably the most dangerous um, uh, material on Earth. Just to note, in uh, nuclear medicine, they actually use iodine-131 in patients who have like hyperthyroid uh, cancers and things like that, because it targets the iodine, uh, the thyroid specifically. And then the way it exits the body is through your um, excretion. So it does, it just we advise patients to flush several times to get rid of it. But we do use it on a regular basis. And also strontium-90 they had men mentioned is also used in uh, bone cancers. I don't know if they use it much anymore. But uh, there was a research hospital they worked at and they did use, um, we injected actually strontium-90. They go straight to the bone. And if you do have bone cancers, what it'll go to, and it'll go ahead and destroy it. It's used mainly for pain purposes for patients that are terminal. So there are medicinal uses for these types of radiation as well. I'd, I'd like to turn it back around to you all and give you a real life question. Uh, the U.S. government right now is trying to decide whether or not and maybe you know more as a, of an update on this than I do, but trying to decide whether or not to provide residents within some radius around every nuclear plant a supply of KI pills. And th this is for real, they're trying to decide this. It would be an enormous logistical uh, challenge to distribute these pills to the right people in the right amounts, but that, that's that's what's on the table. And I realize this may be completely new news to some of you, but have any of you encountered it, that effort at all in any way? I saw it in your And what's your impression of how useful this is going to be? <laughs> Put you on the spot. 
well, I'll, I'll just disclose that I'm kind of a, a nuclear energy advocate. And the, the sense from th this like-minded individuals is that it is essentially a campaign to scare people who live near uh, nuclear facilities. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, there are arguments on both sides, of course. But I, I personally think it's, it's an enormous effort that would largely be wasted. I can give you just a quick update about what the state of Washington does. So we do not give out potassium iodine, except we only do to our workers. Um, mostly because, you know, by the, you can buy potassium iodine in any pharmacy. It's just over the counter. So if you want to take it, go ahead. But clogging yourself with a bunch of potassium and iodine isn't usually the best thing to do either. But uh, uh, so yeah, we only provide it to our response teams who are actually going out into the plume. So if you're not going into the plume, which in reality nobody will, unless it's a huge accident. But um, we only have one, and it's out. It's out in Richland, Washington, the nuclear power plant, which is kind of away from the town. Um, so yeah, we don't give it out here in this state. Some states do. Most of them are kind of like us. They don't either. So. We got a question back there too. Does he have a question? Yeah, he has a question. Okay. Uh, so, it, with regard to the uh, the radon springs, uh, are any of you familiar with Dr. Robert Hargraves and his uh, presentation to the Thorium Energy Alliance about the radiation or Mises hypothesis? Uh, yeah. This is uh, at xlnt.org. Their theory that yeah. 100 millisieverts per year, I, I suppose, is Acceptable, and that's what our emerge. That's what our regulatory limit should be. Uh, Hundred millisieverts um, per year. Yeah, when we talk about late effects or um, of, of radiation, when you're talking about those low doses of radiation, we're talking about late effects that can be induced. And anything below 50 millisieverts, we don't really. It's kind of um, it's unclear what kind of uh, effects those that will have. Um, but radiation limits are annual, so um, the, the rule of thumb, sort of, uh, that we think about is 5% per sievert. For every sievert of radiation dose you receive to your whole body, your risk of a fatal cancer, lifetime risk of a fatal cancer, increases by about 5%. Um, for kids, it's more like 15. For older adults, it's more like 2. But um, in that region of low dose or um, intentional dose, um, the data really isn't all that clear um, whether it can produce a positive or negative effect. And so, of course, we default to the most conservative approach, which is to always minimize the uh, radiation dose. Um, one of the, the laws is something called ALERA, um, as low as reasonably achievable. And that's how we operate. Interestingly, since I'm sitting here, the only, the only uh, area of radiation use that um, is exempt from Alera, I believe, is uh, the therapeutic radiation because we deliver very, very high doses uh, deliberately. Um, other than that, I think Alera is pretty much the general rule. I should back up just a little before. I know you've had your hand up for a while here. But when we say when you were saying hormesis, hormesis is the study of that uh, a little bit of radiation is actually good for you rather than but always bad. A, real, a little bit of something that's otherwise dangerous. Right. So that's what the the doctor down there was trying to get us to adopt a different way. But go ahead. I know you had your hand up. So how far are we from nuclear fusion being a viable source of energy? I can talk about that. I'm a fusion scientist, <laughs> yeah. if you don't mind me stealing your thunder. Please do. So, uh, really, so my name is James, and I work with um, the HIT-SI group here on campus, and we are researching a new form of fusion called, or a new form of magnetic fusion plasma called the SphereMac. We have an entire new way of driving it. Um, I would say that, and now this is a big if, because they have never done this. Are you familiar with the ITER project? So ITER is a um, thermonuclear reactor. It's a nuclear fusion reactor prototype that is being built in France by a collaboration of nations. So there's ourselves, 
Russia, the EU counts as one nation, China, um, Japan, South Korea, South Korea India. and India. Yeah, that's right, and not Canada anymore. Right. Um, thanks. So if they maintain their goals and budgets, we will actually have fusion in less than 20 years. I think that they're first scheduled what's called a fusion burn, so that's, they're going to try to turn it on by 2030 and make what's called the first plasma. That's kind of checking if everything works. You turn on the magnets, you make this ionized gas called a plasma, you can hold it in with the big magnetic fields from the coils on the reactor. Um, but it won't fuse unless you put in the right isotopes of fusion. I believe you said, is there actually hydrogen in a hydrogen bomb? A hydrogen bomb uses um, deuterided and uh, tritiated lithium. So there is some hydrogen, but a specific isotope. Um, they're scheduling that first burn for 2035. Uh, that being said, ITER is a bunch of bureaucrats, and bureaucrats can never get anything done right. Um, so they might end up pushing it back again. And really what it comes down to is the biggest obstacle to fusion is funding. So fusion isn't necessarily economically attractive. It's incredibly ecologically attractive just because there's no, um, the only nuclear waste you get is the actual machine parts, which over the course of the lifetime of the reactor becomes slightly irradiated. So it's not like fission where you have to keep um, dumping spent fuel rods. Uh, it doesn't emit greenhouse gases other than what's used to construct the plants, of course. Um, but economically, it would be very expensive. You know, regular nuclear fission isn't very economically attractive. The problem is that... Hmm? You mean fusion. And fission. In, some, in a lot of cases. I mean, even with Richland, most of the electricity um, in Washington State, at least in Seattle, uses comes from hydroelectric sources, I believe. And that's extraordinarily cheap compared to the price per kilowatt hour from nuclear. Um, but that's really what I'd say it comes down to is funding. We could have fusion in five years if some Elon Musk type figure or Bill Gates said, here is $5 billion, build a fusion reactor, build it right now. I bet that we could do it. But no one has $5 billion to give us right now. So one of the big problems with fusion, I see it some blank scares, or stairs. Sorry. So fusion is the opposite of, kind of the opposite of fission. We're combining uh, uh, nuclides to fuse them together. They give off a lot of energy. Um, well, with the problem with fusion is that uh, you want what the mythical kind of cold fusion thing. So you want to uh, get more energy out than you're putting in. And right now the problem is we're still putting energy in in order to get energy out. So we have to solve that problem. So yeah, like you said. Again, that's mostly a problem though with we're not building big enough confining reactors with powerful enough magnets because those cost a lot of money. We know the physics parameter space. We know how to do it. We're 90% sure we know how to do it. Um, just because there's a lot of instabilities in plasma. All right, I'm, I'm getting yeah. way off to, yeah, thank you so much. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about some of the safety measures that the nuclear plants can have in place. Um, so you mentioned that the one on Three Mile Island did not turn into a disaster because of the safety measures. So what are some of those that can be installed? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember the specifics, and I've never worked there in a, in a nuclear power plant. But one thing that really stuck out to me was that uh, every six weeks, every staff member rotates out of their job and goes through those safety measures again. Mm -hmm. That's how important it is. So um, that's all. That's about all I can say to that. Uh, I'm not a nuclear engineer. They know more about the safety things, but uh, they, I know they do. They do quite a bit of radiation safety. They try to be. Preactive because we we don't want another Chernobyl or a Fukushima and whatnot. So we kind of design, we try to design out any uh, possibilities of, of failure. So like keeping the the thing cool. So we want those backup generators and sometimes backup to the backups to keep water in there and then um, uh, containment. So a lot of times the containment vessel when you look at a nuclear power plant. Can't even see the containment vessel because it's inside 
a giant building that's also kind of reinforced because they want to make sure nothing gets out. But uh, you really have to ask a nuclear engineer for the specifics. But I did remember one. I was at a, the AFRI facility in, in Maryland. Um, it's Air Force uh, <coughs> yeah, it's a reactor. And uh, one of the things that they had was, so in order to moderate these neutrons to produce fission, um, uh, effectively um, and to, and to uh, uh, produce energy is um, you have to have a moderator which is like water for example between these graphite rods or these uh, radioactive rods giving off um, um, neutrons and uh, I, I, I misspoke in graphite anyway uh, there was a mechanical mechanism to remove the um, neutron producing materials from the uh, moderator that would stop the reaction. For example, that's one thing. Just by hitting a button, it would ca cause a situation where it would, it would stop uh, the chain reaction. I'm no engineer either, and I don't mean to be particularly negative, but I think it's important to recognize that whereas we're talking about state-of-the-art safety measures and on the plants in this country. When you look at the existing reactors that are running in uh, primarily the, the former Eastern Bloc and Russia and Ukraine, Belarus, um, virtually everybody I have ever talked to about this problem feel it's a matter of when, not if. And I think I would agree with that too. Uh, these reactors are so vulnerable to uh, hijacking or... Uh, oh, yeah. it, it's, it's really a, a serious problem that nobody's ever seen. That's wrong, actually. Would you like to comment on that? No, Scott? I'd rather focus on okay. what these gentlemen know is part of their expertise. Okay. I have a question for them. Oh, yeah. I think Go ahead. He, he may have a Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is specifically for Scott. Um, so you mentioned the research that you had started on, or at least that you're helping with, on the effects of non-ionizing radiation on the pineal gland and its function. Um, I was just wondering, what exactly is the mechanism there that's going on that you're studying, and is this um, exclusive to the pineal, or is it uh, a general problem with glands and any sort of hormone-producing organ in the body in general? Can you elaborate on the the pineal gland is the primary uh, source of the hormone melatonin it's at the base of the skull. And um, to your question, uh, if I understand your question correctly, you were interested in... Yeah, what's the mechanism that's the, going on? The mechanism, there? yeah. It, it interrupts the, uh, the junction that takes uh, the signal from light in, in the eye and uh, disruption on the retina through the optic nerve back to the to the brain and it um, it as you know I'm sure is a 20 approximately 24 hour cycle it's high during the night and low during the day so it, it has a curve that goes up starting about five o'clock in the afternoon peaks around two or three in the in the morning then comes back down. Well, if you administer, it, it can be, we've shown uh, non-ionizing radiation, or it could be light. When you uh, expose the person that, to either one in the middle of the night, you get a measurable decrease in melatonin. And we think that is part of a cascade then of the events with a number of reproductive hormones that result in an increased risk of breast cancer in this case. So, so it's an interaction with the optic nerve and yep. the retina? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last question. It will be uh, Scott McGovern. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Oh, I have one. Um, I have one or two million questions for you, but I'll just choose one. Um, this one has to do with uh, uh, 
natural background radiation. And I wanted to get, you, all of you obviously have an opinion and you've seen the data on certain areas on the Earth where the natural background radiation is well above the dose limits that are set. This includes not only the area in Iran, which has radon, radium springs, as they call it, where the dose level is very high, but the Malabar Coast in Kerala, India, with the thorium sands there, but also in Brazil, areas in China, but a large area in uh, Scandinavia through the shield area. I'm a geoscientist, so uranium is concentrated in granitic type rocks. And so um, the shield of Canada is another place. And then we have high in the Rocky Mountains above Denver. Yeah, so there it's about 10, 10 millisieverts up to maybe 25 millisieverts if you're spending time up there hiking for a while. So there's a great variety, and this is empirical data. And there have been, so are you satisfied with the studies that have been done, let's say in Ramsar, in Iran, where it's the highest, and in other places that have shown no increased cancer or not? And if you are satisfied with that, then how do you incorporate this into the dose limits? Because this is empirical data. This isn't theoretical data. It isn't statistical data. It's real data. Well, I'll tackle that first. <laughs> not, no, I'm not satisfied at all. Uh, I don't think this is a good example of where it's exceedingly difficult to show an effect with an epidemiological study or a statistical analysis. But the, the papers that the, I'd say there are half a dozen or so key papers in this area. They just don't allow one to conclude that there's a, a real effect there. And adding it to the overall dose is a real problem. That, that would be difficult to do. But generally speaking, no, I don't, I don't think it's been, the book isn't shut yet on that for sure. So you're speaking about the, uh the studies of the people in the areas where right. the background is on. Right. Yeah, you kind of, from a physicist perspective, you've kind of hit the nail on the head. It's, so we're regulated by the linear no, no threshold model. Oh, so, yeah. yep. so every radiation you have is associated with a risk. So that's what the down US, to one hand. Yeah, yeah, so that's what the US has adopted as uh, we got to keep it as low as possible because there's a risk associated with all that. And like you were saying, um, I mean, we, the public dose limit in the United States is 100 millirem a year, whereas our typical background just for being a human living in the United States is 600 millirem a year. So you can see if we were to include background radiation, we've already passed our dose limit. So yeah, but because we have to use that LNT, that's kind of what we're stuck with right now. But physicists, we've been pushing to change that model for a while to maybe put a threshold in there. And we honestly, it kind of goes to the epidemiologist. We need more research in order to get enough uh, proof in there to change kind of the law. So mm. I think a lot of this comes down to what is the risk versus what is the benefit. So if there's a benefit. Um, to moving to Vail, Colorado, um, people don't people wouldn't think about the extra one millisiever per year of dose that they're going to get by moving to Vail, Colorado. Um, when he speak of the annual limit, he's speaking of us giving exposures to people in the public. Mm -hmm. The natural uh, background radiation dose is something like three millisieverts per year. That doesn't include medical. Um, so, uh, and by the way, in the last 35 years, the annual amount of radiation dose that you and as American is has gotten has doubled and that's because of medical exposures so let's go back to the risk versus benefit um, theoretically every medical exposure has a benefit that far outweighs the risk so we're deliberately giving um, the on average and this is mostly from CT scans and other diagnostic imaging like PET, PET imaging and some of the things we do by putting radionuclides in the body but mainly CT imaging, um, there's a benefit that outweighs the risk of giving this dose in, in every case. Um, so we don't go around giving CT scans to everybody. 
um, but um, and we're responsible with um, when we make decisions to give people radiation, but there's always a benefit versus the risk. To me, I'd love to live up in the mountains in Vail, Colorado, and I'd be happy to take another one millisiever per year. Or well, five or ten. Or five. Yeah, if, if you're a three foot flyer yeah. and you went over the pole a lot, the poles a lot, uh, you'll get it pretty quick. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and attending. Most of my uh, cohort, have my cohorts here, so I really appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you. And um, family, friends, Scott Montgomery, thank you. And then the two students I don't know. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this evening. And um, this will continue on for the next uh, 2019 school year. So look out for Global Nuclear Citizen Series. And uh, send me some uh, critiques or some things you'd like to see, or panelists and whatnot. And I'll check it out. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Stick around if you want to talk about um, Especially if you're a student and you're thinking about where to go next in your career or life, you want to talk to us about uh, our fields, we're happy to stick around for a while. Thank you. Thank you.